Never fear, folks. The uh, ratings and rankings season is thankfully almost over, but we're going to continue to uh, rank players all time and otherwise uh, right here at the Voice of College Football on our Ohio State show and uh, unveil Kevin's predictions for the Big Ten season in both divisions. And so we can uh, feast on Kevin and tear him apart. And we will ask that you take part as well. Kevin Noon at the top of the screen there from Buckeye Grove. Steve Hellwagon, Bucknuts 247 Sports. Guys, how are we doing today? Doing great. Doing well. All right. All right, Kevin. We're, we're going to give you some, some time to, um, to buffer yourself, to, to brace for the, the, the attack here. We're going to start with uh, RJ Young. Fox Sports uh, released his all-time Big Ten team offense and defense. We're going to give you a look. Of course, everybody in the live chat, Give it a look as well. Leave your comments, your questions, your debate topics. Uh, we certainly have two right here with predictions and all-time Big Ten team. So let me get it to the board here. And, uh, Kevin, we'll start with you in regards to your thoughts about the all-time well, team. Uh, no, those were your predictions. I knew I was going to do that. There we go. Let's start. Let's go with the offense, of course. Let's start right there with a very controversial selection to begin with with Justin Fields at quarterback. Yeah, as I'm hiding behind the uh, graphic, which I think that the viewers are probably happy that I'm covered up. Um, we were talking about it right in the moments before we went live here that it's kind of an impossible task to be able to compare era versus era versus era because obviously right now we're in a, in a very offensive era era in terms of what quarterbacks are putting up. You see uh, Dwayne Haskins put up huge numbers only to have Justin Fields come in and put up even bigger numbers in some instances. So how do you how do you have Justin Fields ahead of Drew Brees or whoever? I mean, you know, it, it, RJ certainly made, you know, made the call there and picked Ohio State and Justin Fields. Uh, you know, we over at uh, Buckeye Grove had a pretty good discussion about it. Uh, you know, I think the, the view of the Ohio State fans certainly is going to be that, you know, numbers matter. And, uh, you know, I came in with the, the tale of saying that past eras certainly didn't uh, produce the same kind of numbers. And, you know, we could go back to some, you know, previous eras at Ohio State where the quarterback was very much a game manager. But, you know, that certainly has changed. So Justin Fields gets the nod. And I'm sure that there are at least six or seven other fan bases within the 14 that are probably shaking their heads and not buying it. Yeah. I mean, you know, all time quarterback, I, it is a kind of a, a tough question there. I'm looking at uh, last year's big 10 media guide for the career records and drew Brees had 11,792 career yards. He's number one on the list. Curtis Painter, who played at Purdue later on for Joe Tiller, is second. Adam Weber, third. Clayton Thorson, fourth. Brett Bazinet. Finally, you get down to somebody else whose name might be in consideration. Chuck Long is clear down at number six, and he did uh, great things, obviously, at Iowa in the 1980s. Uh, JT Barrett is number 10 on the list with 9,434 yards. I think the problem that you have is comparing guys who played uh, – two years, three years, four years, you know, Fields had two incredible years, no question about it. And uh, one at such a big level, never, lo never lost a game to a big 10 opponent. Uh, Drew Brees uh, obviously, you know, was given so many chances at Purdue, uh, so many more chances, probably throwing 50 balls a game a lot of times and, and different things like that to accumulate. Obviously he's gone on to the NFL and shown, you know, one of the, the greats in NFL history, obviously. So I don't know how you want to measure it. I don't know how you want to look at it. Um, it's kind of like, you know, Bob Greasy. I know he was great in the 1960s, uh, you know, within the Ohio State uh, question. You know, how do you compare Rex Kern, who hardly lost a game in his three years and won three Big Ten championships and a national championship, how do you compare him to – uh, you know, Braxton Miller, Craig Krenzel, Bobby Hoying, Joe Germain, and then now obviously Justin Fields, Dwayne Haskins, JT Barrett. I mean, it, there's each guy does so many different things that it's kind of hard to come on any kind of common ground on, uh, on what to do. Tough calls here, but Fields had two amazing years. And, um, you know, did, were any of Bree's years or any two of Bree's years 
approach what Fields did. Again, Fields never lost a game in the Big Ten. I don't think Drew Brees can say that, obviously. So uh, in any of his years, they were never undefeated. So, um, you know, I, I – it's a fun thing to talk about, and I'm sure as we get into it, we'll have arguments. And, you know, he's got David Boston on there as a wide receiver. I'm not sure David Boston is great, and I mean great as he was, was a better college wide receiver than Chris Carter because Chris Carter was stupid good in the 1980s and, uh, you know, was just out of this world, obviously, for three years for the Buckeyes. So, I mean, there's one there. I saw that. I was like, well, I'm not even sure David Boston's number one on my list all time at Ohio State, irrespective of numbers or anything else. I just think Chris Carter is kind of the beginning, you know, the, the first great wide receiver at Ohio State. So, um, I don't know. We can get into all that. But uh, that's kind of my thought on the quarterback thing. I'll, I'll say okay on fields knowing – that there are other guys who did so many other great things over the course of time. You talk about over a hundred years of college football, you know, it's hard to do. So we'll, we'll see. Before I comment on the quarterbacks and the rest of the list, I'll comment on the production value. If anyone cares, here, here are some issues we're having here. So I apologize. First of all, I'm a novice at the, uh, the, the stream yard, Kevin could probably uh, function this a little bit better than I, but uh, one thing that's rather strange is that I built this on another laptop, the, the graphics. Therefore, I'm not able to, uh, for whatever reason, I can't go into the banners and punch off the graphics at the bottom of the screen to unveil the rest of the, because it's built in some other list. So, so the graphics aren't showing up the same in this list for me to punch off uh, the a banner at the bottom of the screen to give everybody access to the rest of the list there. So I apologize there. And I was trying to pull up another um, back drop so we could um, maybe knock Steve and myself off the picture as well. But anyway, we have what we have here. And to me, I think Steve brings up a great point. Kevin does as well, of course, in that you can just say flat out, okay, I've been watching college football for myself since the late 70s. So regardless of what the statistics say, I'm just going to say Drew Brees is the best quarterback I've ever seen in the Big Ten. You can approach it that way and then say, okay, then I've got to try to go back historically and say, how do I in any way rate these other players versus the guys that I've seen? Or you could just go straight statistics and say, that guy's the most prolific rusher in Big Ten history. He's got to be on the list. Many people would default to Archie Griffin automatically and say he's the only player in the history of college football that won two Heisman trophies. And it's not like he did it in obscurity with bad teams like Paul Horning at 2-8 Notre Dame in 1956. He played in four consecutive Rose Bowls for teams that were competing for national championships that won the Big Ten. So from a winning standpoint and also a standpoint of accolades and – history uh archie griffin of course uh would be a default selection for just about anyone but i do respect rj young's list with ezekiel elliott because i think what he pulled off in 2014 down the stretch against wisconsin alabama and oregon is truly historic and has been unmatched in regards to rushing the football against elite competition under pressure with a national championship on the line uh, but again, back to quarterback, I got to default myself to Drew Brees. He's the best I've ever seen in the Big Ten. Obviously, at an NFL level, he and Brady are the best that the Big Ten has ever served up, unless I'm missing somebody, and I really don't think I am. Those are the two best. Yeah, I mean, you definitely within your right to think that. And believe me, I've been there on days. Uh, Drew Brees threw for 400 yards against Ohio State and beat him almost single-handedly. So uh, I've seen it with my own two eyes. And, uh, you know, that is uh, that is what it is. But, um, yeah, I mean, again, there's going to be a lot of tough calls in the course of this. Um, if somebody sat here and said nobody's ever had a two-year body of work in the Big Ten like Justin Fields did, then I'd say, yeah, you're probably right there too. So, um, you know, what Haskins did, what was it, 50 passing touchdowns and four rushing touchdowns was pretty good. And uh, JT Barrett obviously was a stat accumulator, both running the football and throwing the football. And touchdowns-wise, he put a touch total touchdown mark out there way out in the stratosphere that I don't think anybody uh, uh, is ever going to touch. So, um, you know, I'm open to suggestion on it. And, uh, you know, we can look at some of the other positions as well. 
You know what I find fascinating, Kevin and Steve, about uh, football lists, all time versus baseball and basketball, is there are different positions in baseball and basketball, of course, but everybody does the same thing. Everybody fields, everybody throws, everybody hits in baseball. So you can compare a catcher to a second baseman offensively to a certain extent. Uh, in basketball, everybody shoots, everybody scores, everybody rebounds, everybody passes. But to compare an offensive tackle to a quarterback to a linebacker, the skill sets and then the statistics aren't even comparable. Offensive linemen don't even have statistics. That's all based on reputation and just the eye test. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, you know, we basketball is moving more positionless, so you don't necessarily, you know, a two guard is not a two guard it, like the way it was before. But certainly when you look at football, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult and you sit there and you see the way that the list was built. I mean, it's not necessarily in a situation you have Orlando Pace up well, well above some of the other offensive linemen. It looks like the list, the way that R.J. Young put it out there, but um yeah, it, 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 it's just as we go from era to era and try and make heads or tails of that. I mean, you know, we're just talking about guys of how they how they, you know, how they fit in into their into their teams and into their positions. And, you know, Orlando Pace certainly has some you know age on the rest of the offensive linemen that are there. But, you know, give me Joe Thomas for the time that he was playing. I mean, you know, I think Tristan Wirfs, somebody, you know, with being an Ohio state channel here. And we're mostly being seen by Ohio state fans. He's, you know, an Iowa player, probably not looked at as much or, or Greg Esslinger at Minnesota, but you know, both of those guys were extremely dominating during their times. So it's, you know, it, 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 it's a good history lesson to kind of go through here, but you know, I think in the offense, we certainly see a little bit more recency bias than what we'll see when we turn the page over to the defense, where there's some guys who are playing, during certainly the standard definition times and maybe even the black and white times. Running back to me is Archie Griffin, two Heisman trophies, and Ron Dane, the career uh, rushing leader, to my feeling. I mean, I think those are the two pretty easy picks. And, and, and it's and I say easy, it just to me, those are the two that just make the most sense. But you look at the career rushing list, Jonathan Taylor, he had an amazing career at Wisconsin. He's second, Archie Griffin is third. And then you go on down, you got Justin Jackson from Northwestern. Anthony Thompson from Indiana was an all-time great. Monty Ball, Wisconsin. Mike Hart, Melvin Gordon, Lorenzo White, Anthony Davis, who played at Wisconsin uh, almost 20 years ago. So a lot of Wisconsin guys on that list, and I think I'm giving the best one, Ron Dane, uh, his props on that. And then uh, Archie Griffin I would put up there. But, you know, Eddie George <clears> – <throat> Again, his junior and senior year stack up with anybody. And Elliot, I would say his sophomore and junior year stock stack up with anybody. Uh, you know, they were both probably close to 4,000 yards or 3,500 yards in their last two seasons at Ohio State, George and Ezekiel Elliott. So, uh, you know, again, probably 15 guys for two spots there. And, and my two would be Ron Dane and Archie Griffin if I had to – if you put a gun to my head and said, pick two great, you know, the two greatest Big Ten running backs. Yeah, not having a two time Heisman guy on there is difficult. But again, it's era to era and and everything else. I mean, the recency will certainly have Zeke Elliott on there. I mean, Jonathan Taylor. I mean, I just think you you can go to a basket of Wisconsin running backs and it's just dude after dude after dude after dude. That program certainly creates some great running backs. I mean, obviously a program that's built on offensive lines, but we've also seen that same program have some average guys at running back who have not nearly been as successful as a guy like a Jonathan Taylor or a Ron Dane or a Monty Ball, uh, you know, Corey Clement, keep going and going and going down the list. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I could definitely make the argument that Zeke Elliott, when the chips were on the table, played some of the most high leverage minutes of anybody out there. Um, you know, for just my age, I remember Ron Dane just being a little, a little older or whatever, just being more, more dominating than anybody. Uh, you know, and that's not taking anything away from Jonathan Taylor, but I guess I would, you know, Dane and George, I don't know, Dane and Zeke. I don't, I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to make this list. I was very glad to write about it because somebody else 
is having to fall on the sword and I can sit there and be the, the hindsight is 2020. I told you so, I told you so. But even in this position, I still don't have a lot of definitive answers. No, I don't have an issue with the offense flying the wide receivers and the running backs. Again, my quarterbacks, Drew Brees, uh, I would have a different, a, a few different guys, but like Kevin said, I have no issue with it. It's not like I think it, there's been some egregious error made by any stretch. Uh, who, who are the who are the wide receivers? I mentioned David Boston. Who did Charles that? Rogers up there. I'll bring it up. My left click will work. Well, as I look here. at the career receiving list, what you have is a list that's been stacked because Purdue throw the ball so predominantly throughout the 2000s with Joe Tiller. The top three guys are John Standiford at 3,700, Taylor Stubblefield 3,600, and Dorian Bryant 3,500. And I don't think anybody you know thinks of them as one of the all-time greats in the history of the sport. Uh, Braylon Edwards comes in at 3,500 from Michigan. He's number four. Lee Evans was pretty good at Wisconsin, 3,400. Uh, David Williams from Illinois from back in the 80s when they had uh, Dave Wilson, I think, was their quarterback. Uh, Dwayne Bates, Northwestern. Tyler Johnson of Minnesota, who just wrapped up a few years ago. Jared Abradaris from Wisconsin. Eric Decker from Minnesota. But for my money, you know, Chris Carter is – you know, pound for pound, as good as anybody or better on that list, in my mind. And, you know, just and, and Terry Glenn had one great year. I saw somebody mention how about Terry Glenn, you know, 17 touchdowns in one season. That's crazy, um, you know, that uh, that he did that. The second most in a season in Big Ten history, Desmond Howard, I guess, caught 19 touchdown passes when he won the Heisman Trophy in 1991 although a lot of what he did was also predicated on on what he was able to do as a kickoff and punt return guy. So, um, you know, I don't know that he's considered a pure, pure wide receiver that um, would be on this list. But, uh, again, I'm open. I, I'm not sure the system guys, as I will uh, characterize them from Purdue, deserve a lot of credit. Uh, you know, you, you know, John Standiford, Taylor Stubblefield, if you put them in a lineup, I couldn't pick them out of a crowd. So, uh, you know, I'm sure great guys and, and, and just ran great routes, and Drew Brees gave them the ball, and they called 60 pass plays a game. So, you know, that was kind of, you know, you could have put anybody in that spot. They probably would have had – the same numbers or better or, you know, real close. So that's kind of my two cents on that. Yeah. While Purdue had the system to be pass happy for years and years and years, Ohio state had the opposite system. Yeah. You know, we did have, you know, a couple of years where guys would, you know, would, would step up and obviously talking about, uh, you know, the Terry Glenn year. I mean, there certainly were some guys, Joey Galloway, there were guys that had those big stretches, but I mean, Ohio state, you know, we're not that far removed from what was it, you know, the, the, the clown show year where 14 receptions led the team or whatnot. So, you know, it's a real, I mean, it, the numbers are always going to be a little bit skewed just based on what the offense is. And, you know, we're at least not seeing anybody that was a receiver today where you have Paris Campbell catching nearly 100 balls or whatever, but, you know, the average pass is a little short one, and it's a, it's a yard yards after catch type of situation. Um, you know, Desmond Howard makes the list. I mean, obviously, as Steve said, I remember what his uh, other talents were in terms of the return game and whatnot. Uh, you know, that's where it's always going to be uh, permanently etched or scarred, depending on how you talk about it, and into my, into my memory. Uh, David Boston, certainly, I mean, he was a guy that came in as a true freshman and lit it up in that, I believe his first year was the year that Ohio State opened with Pitt and Rice, and he just went insane in those first couple of games, and, you know, he put up some big numbers, and unfortunately for him, he just got too big once he got into the NFL, some of the pictures of him with the uh, then San Diego Chargers and just legs for arms, it was uh Kind of nutso for that, but uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know if I, I don't know if Charles Rogers or David Boston are, are two of the first three people I'm ripping off. If you ask me this question just in a vacuum and say name the, you know, top three receivers in Big Ten history uh, for football, um, but I don't know, I don't know who necessarily jumps in in my mind there because I certainly have a 
you know, mid eighties on memory bank. So that's kind of where my strength is. And, you know, that's just kind of where we stand. Let's uh, check out the defensive side of the ball. Big 10 history. Again, if you're just joining us, uh, RJ Young of Fox sports has released his all big 10 team all time. No RT Griffin, no Drew Brees. And then we could list off about 52 people past that, not on the first team. And uh, Steve did a great job of running down the all-time yardage list, both at receiver, quarterback, and at running back. So now we move on to the defense. And uh, we will see this list, which includes... He starts in the defensive backfield here. We've got Charles Woodson, who, of course, is the last defensive player to win a Heisman Trophy in 1997. Chris Gamble, who may have logged the most plays in modern college football history, just never left the field and, of course, became a longtime player in the NFL with the Panthers. Jack Tatum, probably the longest tenured until we get a little bit further down the list there. For a while, I thought, man, Jack Tatum, that's the first time he's gone pre-1985-86. But Chris Spielman, of course, was, I think, Steve, a three-time consensus All-American. He was just ridiculously good. Of course, started for that Rose Bowl team as a freshman. Jim Leonard, a tremendous safety at Wisconsin, who's turned into a tremendous coach as well. Ryan Kerrigan off the edge for Purdue is a great player on both levels. Washington Redskins, Bronco Nagurski. Now, there you go with a legendary name. It's kind of hard to argue that, even though <laughs> we don't have a soul alive who's seen him play. Chase Young, very recently off the edge for Ohio State, uh, racked up, what, 18 or 19 sacks a couple years ago. Ryan Shazier, uh, I know Tony would love this pick here because I remember a show that we did maybe a year ago where he was uh, touting Ryan Shazier, who wasn't even on all-time uh, Big Ten lists recently, uh, not even from an all-time perspective. I don't even know that he made an all-decade team. And Ryan Shazier was just ridiculously good. And then, of course, J.J. Watt on both levels has <clears> been uh, a Hall of Famer. So what do you think, Steve? Well, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Charles Woodson, obviously, was predominantly a defensive player and a return man and dabbled a little bit on offense in 1997 when he won the Heisman Trophy. He, he beat Ohio State in all three facets in that uh, single game in 97. Uh, when they clinched the Rose Bowl and, you know, went on and won a share of the national championship and clinched the Heisman Trophy that day with that. Um, so, yeah, he deserves a spot on this team, I think, as as one of the the top players, you know, however you want to quantify it. Uh, Jack Tatum has that reputation as the, the fiercest hitter, obviously, and, and was a member of a national championship team at Ohio State in 68 and a team that, you know, received some championship mention in 1970. Chris Gamble's interesting. Um, you know, he had a very good career at Ohio State, two-year starter uh, at cornerback, uh, left after his junior year, and uh, had a good NFL career, so that's good. Chris Spielman, you know, he has, again, Ohio State's hat is, is, you know, Penn State has the reputation as linebacker U, but Ohio State, in a lot of regards, is right there, you know, name for name. Uh, with Penn State, when you're talking about Randy Gratishar, uh, uh, Dwight Ike Kelly back in the 60s, Randy Gratishar in the 70s, Tom Cousineau in the late 70s, Marcus Merrick, Glenn Cobb, Chris Spielman, Pepper Johnson, uh, Steve Tovar in the late 80s, and then you come up through the 90s, uh, you had a, a lot of great linebackers there in the 90s, like Andy Katzenmoyer was there in the 90s. Um, and then in the 2000s with Matt Wilhelm and uh, James Laurinaitis and, uh, you know, some other guys I'm probably leaving off of there. So A.J. Hawk. A.J. Hawk. Oh, Bobby A.J. Carpenter. Hawk was fabulous. Bobby Carpenter was very good. Um, uh, Shazier uh, was good. Uh, True Studs, you know, is Raekwon McMillan in that group? I don't know. Jerome Baker, I don't know. They're both in the NFL right now. So, you know, I just gave you 15 or 20 names of guys who in their era were among the best linebackers, not only in the Big Ten, but also nationally. And uh, some of them were All-Americans. Laurinaitis, for instance, was a three-time All-American 
and uh, won one of the major awards, whether it was the Nagurski or the, the linebacker award, Lombardi or whatever it was. I know Spielman won one of those major national awards. I think it was the Lombardi trophy he won. Um, but Andy Katzenmoyer, his sophomore year, does anybody ever had a better season as a linebacker than he had? And of course, in his freshman year, he was kind of spotlighted with seniors all around him and they, they did all the dirty work and he got to clean up and make the tackle. So I don't know. I mean, it, it, again, you could put three Ohio State linebackers on this list and it probably wouldn't be right because Penn State's had some guys, obviously. You know, Penn State, I think more about linebacker you with Jack Ham. you know, what they did before they were a member of the Big Ten Conference. I don't know that they've had, you know, that many guys who have been at the tip top of the Big Ten. Uh, I mean, they had a few, you know, certainly a few and some guys that have stuck in the NFL for a while, no doubt. But um, I think Ohio State, in the time both teams have played against each other these last almost 30 years now, believe it or not, uh, this is going on, uh, that they've played each other as Big Ten opponents. Ohio State's woefully outdistanced, you know, what Penn State's done at linebacker, I think, in that time. So, um, yeah, that's a lot of my thoughts on it. Uh, the the sacks and the tackles for loss, I kind of looked at those stats. Simeon Rice is the all-time career Big Ten sack leader with 44. Uh, Jared DeVries, Mark Mester, Michigan, Mike Vrabel. Uh, you got to go down the line a little bit to find Ryan Kerrigan. Uh, you know, so that's kind of my feeling on him is good, but was he, you know, one of the all, all-time, all-time greats? I don't know. Um to me, if I'm putting Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa, and Chase Young alongside one another, I'm probably taking Joey Bosa is is probably my pick. But uh, I can also see, you know, was Joey Bosa ever fourth in the Heisman Trophy balloting? No, he was not. So, you know, Chase Young, you know, probably as a defensive player did something that nobody uh, before or since has done. I mean, obviously – we talked about Woodson winning it, but, uh, you know, 23, 24 years ago. Um, Courtney Brown, Penn State. Uh, Jared DeVries from Iowa seems to me, he's the all-time leader in uh, tackles for loss with 78. Seems like there ought to be a place for him on here somewhere. So, you know, you can go in a lot of different directions on this. And, uh, you know, Big Daddy Wilkinson was the number one overall pick of the NFL draft in uh, 94 and he had two very good years as a defensive tackle 92 and 93 for the Buckeyes you know are you breaking it out for defensive ends as your defensive line or can you throw a plugger in there as a defensive tackle I don't know so again a lot of arguments you can have in comparing apples to oranges but uh, yeah I'm 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 good with it he's got some great names on that team and uh, you know you think about Dick Butkus played at Illinois I mean is there ever been a better linebacker in, in the history of the sport than Dick Buckness? Well, you know, could he hold up in 2000? I don't know. So, Yeah, there's not really a lot that I can add here at this point, and I think I just froze up. Shoot. No, you're with us. Yeah, okay. we can my, my, my screen froze oh, up. Well. But we'll see what's happening. Um, yeah, I can't really add. Steve took us on a really good history lesson there. Um, I would just be – I'd just be repeating stuff in terms of that, but, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of room for debate there, especially when you look at linebacker and what Ohio State's had, and certainly, you know, the debate on who the true LBU is between Ohio State or, or Penn State. You know, an interesting thing is we kind of combine both lists. You have 22 spots there, and Ohio State holds down nine of them. Nine of 22, nobody else has more than four. I think it goes nine, four, three, two, and then some ones. Uh, and a player that we didn't talk about on the bottom of this list because it was right at the bottom of the screen is LeVar Arrington out of Penn State. And he, you know, he certainly had a couple of wow plays during his career. Somebody that uh, I always enjoyed watching play. Absolutely. He did have some wow plays. Uh, in particular, there was a game against, there, there were a couple of games against Pitt and Minnesota in, I believe, 1999, where he, he just went crazy. In terms of just, you know, off the edge, strip sacks, blocked field goals, just everything possible that could be done to win a game uh, that particular season. Uh, 
looking oh. around for some other names. Jamar Fletcher was a tremendous cornerback. Yeah, uh, I was, at uh, Wisconsin. I was just going to throw in on the DBs. Uh, Jamar Fletcher was fourth all time in interceptions with twenty one. Jim Leonard, who's on the list, is also tied with him uh, at uh, fourth all time in interceptions with twenty one. Niall Kinnick is a guy uh, number nine all time in interceptions at eighteen, maybe the greatest player in Iowa history. Niall Kinnick, they talk a lot about him. He probably played two ways, so he's probably an offensive player as well there in the late 30s. Charles Woodson, uh, you know, again, kind of adding to his legend, is also in a tie for ninth all-time in the Big Ten with 18 interceptions. And we know, uh, obviously, he was so much more than just a guy who intercepted passes. He, he changed the game, eliminated, uh, you know, the opposing wide receiver and – return kicks and punts as well. So his impact on the game, you know, to be ninth on the career interception list puts you in p position to be mentioned on this team, but <clears throat> kind of cements his legacy as well. He was not just a flash in the pan type player who just made the highlight real plays. He was a guy for all seasons. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm good with the guys that they mentioned again. Uh, you know, there are, uh, so many, so many uh, guys, you know, Heisman Trophy winners that Ohio State had, like Vic Janowitz, who played both sides of the football. Uh, Hop Cassidy, you know, in the 50s is primarily a runner, but probably also played two platoon football there. And, uh, you know, the two platoon system really didn't go out until the early 60s is when they relaxed the substitution rules. Basically, and a lot of people don't e that follow the sport today don't even know this, that up until about 62 or 63, if you started a quarter, you know, offense or defense, your 11-man unit uh, for offense or defense that started the quarter, those players stayed on the field and you could substitute, you know, you could take them out and put somebody in, but they couldn't come back for the rest of that quarter, believe it or not. That's how th – there were no specialized – well, this is our three wide receiver set. This is our nickel defensive back set. There was none of that. I mean, if you if Jack Tatum was on the field, now that's a bad example because he didn't play then. Let's say Hop Cassidy. If Hop Cassidy from the 50s was on the field playing offense and you didn't want him out there to play defense, but it was getting late in the period and you didn't figure get the ball back, then you could take him out and put somebody else in but Hop was ineligible to go back in the game until the end of the quarter, either the end of the second quarter, the end of the third quarter, then he could go back into the start the fourth quarter. So that's something, and he'd have to play both ways. And if for whatever reason he had to come out of the game, he couldn't play again until the, the next quarter. So I'm not sure how they handled injuries in that regard. I assume it was the same way, but um, it was a different game. And the guys, a lot of the guys never left the field for anything. I mean, if it was a close game, if it's a blowout game, you'd probably pull them early in the fourth quarter and let the other guys play. But, you know, that was just how the uh, how it was back in those days. I've told my son this and others. I've said when you watch uh, those old uh, games from the 40s, 50s and 60s and those guys are scoring touchdowns and they're not jumping around, going crazy. They had no energy. Doing all sorts. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they had to get on the, uh, you know, the extra point team. They had to get on the <laughs> kickoff team. Then they had played it. They were tired. They were playing every play. Talk about sub packages. There was not even just offensive and defensive players there. I'm not sure if for punting and kicks, if they were allowed to substitute or not. I don't, I, it's my inclination. I don't think they did because a lot of times it would be a guy who was a regular would kick the extra points and that type of thing. So maybe they relaxed that as they kind of got along to it and realized, hey, it's a better game if you actually send somebody out there who can kick the football you know, that's got the ability to do that. Maybe they made an uh, allowance for that. I assume they had somebody on each sideline and official tracking those substitutions because that had to get, uh, you know, pretty complicated after a while. Kind of like the soccer guy holds up the, holds up the sign, you know, with the two numbers on it, nine is going in and 14 is coming out, but uh, that's how it was. It was not, uh, it was not a fluid thing where you could put, five new guys in and take five guys out. It was just not, it wasn't the way it was done. My father-in-law played at Ohio university in the early sixties. He was one of the last two platoon guys. He played center and linebacker at Ohio university. And then I think by his senior year, you were allowed 
to have a little bit freer substitution pattern, and he would come out sometimes. But he uh, he was a first team All American at Ohio University as a linebacker, so that was uh, pretty heady stuff for him back in those days. Lou Crow said, "Congratulations, you get 105 scholarships or unlimited scholarships. You're only going to play 11 players, so you know that's okay. it. Yeah, yeah." Lou Groza possibly being the most famous example of what Steve's talking about, of course, as an offensive tackle and a great field goal kicker uh, on both levels. All right, uh, just a few notables before we move on. Uh, we talked a lot about LeVar Arrington, and he was on the list, but the guy that played on the opposite end of the line, Courtney Brown, was a pretty good player as well. He yeah. was actually drafted one spot ahead of him as the, num the number one overall selection by the Cleveland Browns, Bubba Smith. Michigan State, of course. One of the uh, all-time greats. One of the all-time greats as well. Was he uh, part of the fearsome foursome? Was, that, was he part of that? Or is he uh, not part of that? No, he was on the Baltimore Colts. The fearsome okay. foursome, he had um, Merlin Olsen, Rosie Greer, um, Deacon Jones. Oh, my. Had those guys on the Los <laughs> Angeles Rams fearsome foursome. But uh, James Laurinaitis. Yeah, three-time All-American. Paul Post Mike, Leslie. Mike Goss. Mike Goss was a three time All American. I was just going to bring up uh, our guy, Cowboy Steo. I can't read. No, uh, no. Steve O uh, brought up Mike Doss there. Yes. Uh, exceptional. The national championship. Yeah. yeah the, the, the easy thing on this is the national championship since 1968 are pretty easy to, to count three of them. And Michigan's was a split in 97. Uh, you know, Minnesota had a bunch back in the 30s. Ohio State, you know, Woody had three or four, and, and Paul Brown had one, but there weren't a lot of, of – from 1940 on, there weren't a lot of uh, national championship teams from the Big Ten. <clears throat> Let's uh, knock out a couple questions, and then we'll get to Kevin's predictions uh, just to catch up on a few items here since we like to honor and uh, – uh, first, I'll honor the Super Chats. Uh, Yakov, appreciate that, uh, as well as NH. Thank you so much for the uh, Super Chat contributions. Uh, we had someone ask about uh, Addison Nichols, the third-rated uh, center slash guard in the country, depending on your service. That's the composite uh, top 100 player out of Georgia, whether that we expect uh, him to make a decision soon. Yeah, I think a decision is going to be coming soon. I don't have a date in front of me on there, but, uh, you know, he has a top three of Ohio State, Tennessee, and North Carolina. I tend to think Tennessee might be the team that's ahead, but, you know, nothing would really surprise me on that one, but Ohio State's certainly pursuing guys like Ernest Green, uh, Cam Dewberry already has a couple of linemen in the class with Tegra Shabola, as well as George Fitzpatrick. So... Uh, you, you know, you you get down to a final three when you're pretty close, and you also look at Addison Nichols. He has taken his official to Ohio State, did not official either of the other two schools. Um, you know, nothing would surprise me. Ohio State recruits the greater Atlanta area so well. He certainly had a great visit to Columbus, but if I were to put in a future cast at this point, it would probably be to Tennessee. Um that, that's probably where I would lean as well on this. And I know that uh, at least one of the experts in our network has picked Tennessee as well. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing. And uh, in my chat this week, I was asked, you know, is Greg Studraba on shaky ground because they haven't recruited a top flight, you know, offensive lineman. And we were going to discuss that they just got the uh, commitment. Was it George Kirkpatrick? Is that his Fitzpatrick. name? Fitz Fitzpatrick. Thank you for correcting me. Don't have it in front of me. I should have made a note of it before we came on here. I didn't I didn't write about it this week because we had other people on our staff that did. And I apologize to, to George, but from Colorado. And he's only like 250 or 260 in the composite, probably a three-star, maybe a, a low four-star player, whatever he may be. And my response was, well, and this was in my chat that I do on Mondays on Bucknuts. I said, well, you know, he just sent two players, Wyatt Davis and Josh Myers, to the NFL. He's going to send two more, Thayer Munford and Nicholas Petit Ferrer, you would figure, will leave after this upcoming season. And uh, they'll go to the NFL. And he did get 
uh, Paris Johnson, who was a national top 10 player a couple of years out of Cincinnati, and he may start this season. And uh, they got Donovan Jackson out of the state of Texas, who was a national top 10 prospect as well. So, you know, you can't come to me and say, why doesn't Stud get the best guys when in two of the last three classes, he, Ohio State has signed a national top 10 player. They also signed four or five offensive linemen in one class here recently and another four or five another year. They've got like 17 offensive linemen on scholarship. There's plenty of depth. Uh, Tony on here a few weeks ago said the only thing that troubles him about the offensive line is knowing who's going to start at left tackle next season. That's the only question he has because every other position this season and next season is pretty much spoken for. The only question is if Nicholas Petit Ferrer does decide to leave and you have to replace both tackles, what, uh, you know, where, where are you left? So I think Greg Studrawa on the whole, and, and you know, you, you set offensive records because your offensive line's pretty good. And the last three years with him as the offensive line coach, they've set some outrageous records for points and yards and passing yards and ran the football effectively and, you know, all these other things. I mean, some outrageous numbers that are going to be hard. I don't think they're going to match some of the numbers that they've had in the past this year just because they have a new quarterback. But um, I think that uh, to come at me and say, well, they don't have a top 100 offensive line recruit in this class is kind of myopic. I think you, you're not – you can't see the forest for the trees, in my opinion. A couple thoughts there. One, I mean, we look at this year's class, and Tegra Shabola, he's, according to Rivals, is number 136. Cam Dewberry is a five-star. Ernest Green is a five-star. I think that part of the issue that Stud runs into is he is a victim of Ohio State's recruiting success at so many other positions. When you look at Larry Johnson bringing in, depending on which service you are, where Jack Sawyer was and where uh, JT Tuomolo out was, you have that. You have Brian Hartline in the receiver room going in and just going crazy in terms of his recruiting. More more years than not, Ohio State's defensive back recruiting is completely off the charts. So you have all these positions that may be tops in the nation in their given classes, and maybe Stud hasn't necessarily had a class to where he is put – two or three of those top 50 guys, whether or not top two or three of them are necessarily available because Ohio State hasn't been able to go into Alabama or, or Mississippi or some of these states and be able to recruit with any great frequency. But, you know, you look at certain positions to where he's just not necessarily had, you know, had that class. And I think a lot of people, too, are still holding Jackson Carmen against him, uh, having an Ohioan disappear like that, you know, another another Ohioans going to Clemson, another young guy. So it's a lot easier to focus on the ones that you don't get versus the ones that you do get. So I think some of the criticism of Stud is probably just bad messaging. But you know, there there have been a couple misses along the way. But you know what? I think if you sit there and you put Greg Sturara in another Big Ten program and he lands the same kids without the backdrop of Larry Johnson, Brian Hartline, whatever, you know, he's he's up for top recruiter of the year at his school. Yeah, and Kerry Combs is picking up that ball again in, in the secondary. He's going to be getting top 50 and top 100 guys, it looks like. Running back, obviously, to get Travion Henderson was huge. And at quarterback, I mean, uh, what they are doing at quarterback, I'm not sure Corey Dennis is getting the uh, credit he deserves with the quarterbacks they've landed, although most people – <clears throat> would look at that and say, well, it's Ryan Day. But uh, certainly uh, all these guys are carrying their uh, weight, you know, carrying their water and doing their share, it looks to me. Uh, before we get to uh, Kevin's uh, predictions, uh, a couple notes uh, in the Big Ten and also in the state of Ohio. Trev Alberts has been uh, – Reports are coming out that he's been named uh, the AD at the University of Nebraska and also that Frank Solich is needing to step down after years and years at uh, Ohio University as the all-time winningest coach in the MAC. Uh, Steve, your thoughts about uh, Solich and Alberts? 
Well, uh, Solich, it was unfortunate it didn't work out for him at Nebraska. He got him to the 2001 National Championship game against Miami. I guess it was played early 2002, BCS, and they got smoked. And Nebraska really has not been relevant since that moment in, in many regards. Uh, I'm not sure that if they have they won a conference championship since then. I, I don't believe that they have. Oh. They, did, they did play for the Big Ten title the one year, I guess, and gave up uh, 70. Uh, as my friend uh, Todd Jones from the formerly the Columbus Dispatch, we were sitting outside the courtyard there in Indianapolis with the disheveled Nebraska fans after Wisconsin, who shouldn't have even been in the game, uh, put up 70 points on them. And, and about every 10 minutes, uh, Todd Jones would take a puff of the smoke and he'd look over at the guy and just say 70. And the guy would say, if you say that again, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. This is about three in the morning after all the bars had closed after the game. But, uh, you know, they haven't, they haven't made it back to relevancy with him without him since then. So uh, to, uh, Solich was a rare guy who came to a mid American conference school late in his career and made it his career. I mean, he, you know, it's rare that a guy would stay 15 years or however many exact number of years it was and uh, do the things that he did and get him to a bowl game almost every year there toward the end and win four division championships and, and get him, you know, into the conference championship game and made it, made him relevant. I mean, OU, you know, has always been kind of a middle of the road, four and eight six and six kind of team, you know, in the last 40 years, but he made them, you know, more of a nine and three, 10 and two type team, which uh, was a lot of fun, I think, for the people down there in Athens. And, you know, they've got a pretty good fan base and, and you know, uh, I hope the next guy can carry on what, uh, what he's done. And uh, of course they're, they're swimming upstream with Buffalo right now in that Eastern division that, that looks to be the best team uh, you know, year in and year out right now. But uh, Ohio University, uh, with the right people, can contend again. And, and he did amazing things there. So hats off to him uh, for the job that uh, Solich did, Frank Solich there at Ohio U. And good luck to the new guy, one of his assistants and offensive coordinators taking over there. So, uh, you know, the continuity will be good. Everybody will, you know, just keep right on rolling there. Uh, Trev Alberts was a bit of a troll in his time at ESPN. And I don't remember which episode it was that finally cost him his job or if he just walked away from it or, or what happened. But uh, he was not among Ohio State fans' favorites. He, he liked to troll the Ohio State uh, fan base. Everybody knew he was a Nebraska guy. Um, I have no idea what he's done outside of broadcasting and playing football to know whether he is fit to run a you know $150 million a year athletic department at Nebraska – and all the the schools that uh, that you know all the teams that they have. So uh, I'm uh, I guess I'm drawing a blank on him in terms of that. But uh, maybe you guys know better than me what what is deserving. Uh, and obviously, you know, for Nebraska football, you know, as we said, it's been languishing for 20 years. Maybe he is the guy with the vision to help whoever the coach will be. If he and he and Scott Frost did not play together, they're five years apart in terms of age. So Alberts would have played there in the early 90s, and then Frost came in in the mid to late 90s. And, uh, I mean, they're probably well acquainted, obviously, over the years, but uh, there's no special affinity for him as a former Nebraska teammate to hang on to him. He's going to hold Frost to some very high standards, I think, because Trev Alberts is in that job, quite frankly, to put Nebraska into the Big Ten championship hunt and again, get them back into the top 10, the top 15 nationally and, you know, compete for this playoff. That's kind of what uh, what Nebraska will be shooting for. So and they'd be crazy not to. But I'm sure Kev's got uh, got a couple ideas about it. Yeah. Trev Alberts for the last 12 years was the AD at uh, University of Nebraska, Omaha. So he was already in the system. Certainly a very different sized program and responsibilities between UNO and UNL. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, they are contemporaries to a certain extent, but did not overlap in terms of playing careers. You know, Trev is certainly going to understand that a winning product is the best thing for his career longevity. So, you know, while I don't expect him to come in with uh, with the machete, 
I think that he's certainly not going to just start the clock over and say, okay, here's five more years, Scott. You need to uh, get some things going. As for Trev at, uh, at ESPN, maybe he can bring in Mark May as his associate AD. And then uh, for Frank Solich, I, I go back to Nebraska's decision to get rid of him, and I liken it to an extent. But it's even worse at Nebraska than what happened at Minnesota. Be careful what you wish for. Glenn Mason would get the Gophers to the bowl game. They would suddenly not play defense, get exposed on a big stage, and this would, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. And Minnesota boosters, alumni, fans, what have you, uh, said, well, we can do better than this. Well, they certainly haven't yet. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. But congratulations to Frank Solich for calling it a career, focusing on, uh, you know, his health now at this point. Uh, you know, he certainly had made, uh, you know, he was a major contributor into the hashtag of Maction and everything of us, you know, being excited about watching games on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, whatever day ESPN decided to put Tuesday it on. morning football. We were there watching it. We were there watching it. Well done, gentlemen. On Frank Solich and Trev Alberts, uh, my thoughts you can find all over my channel, so we'll not uh, take up any more time because we want to get to uh, Kevin's predictions that you can find on Buckeye Grove on Rivals. So, Kevin, before you dive into your predictions that we'll display on the screen, somebody had commented in the live chat to make sure that everybody subscribes to uh, to Kevin's channel. So, uh, Kevin, well... Let me let me do the <laughs> at least let you uh, talk while we can see your face uh, to let everyone know where they can subscribe. Yeah, it's uh, the vid the channel's called Buckeye Grove Video. I mean, obviously, an offshoot of BuckeyeGrove.com. We're trying to do a little bit more live content. I, I'm just I'm just trying to follow Mark. I like all the stuff that Mark channel Mark Rogers does on his channel, so I'm just trying to follow that path. Uh, generally doing our shows on Tuesdays, but we're just trying to find that sweet spot as to where we can get the most participation. Again, you can follow us over at uh, Buckeye Grove Video on uh, YouTube. Oh, Kevin, you'll figure out very quickly that you can do much better than that. <laughs> All right, uh, here we've got uh, Kevin's predictions. Let's start in the Big Ten Western Division, and again, I will try to display the entire list. Yeah, I went through and created a uh, an Excel spreadsheet with all the schedules and made sure so the math worked that, every, you know, especially in league games, you know, if Iowa beats Wisconsin, you got to mark Iowa with a win and Wisconsin with a loss or whatever, and this is kind of what I came up with. I don't see a perennial power coming out of the West per se in terms of somebody going through and going 8-1 and one and 11-1 one, on the season. I think it's going to come down to Iowa, Wisconsin. I think it's really going to come down to a head-to-head -head game between the two of them. I like Iowa to win that one. Uh, as we kind of look through the rest of it, Northwestern takes a little bit of a step back, but I think uh, that Pat Fitzgerald has gotten the team into a position to where they should be able to at least be in the conversation four out of five years in the West. Uh, you, you know, I got Minnesota with the fighting, row the boats uh, a couple games back. And then, as we were talking about Nebraska, three and six along with Purdue, probably not going to get it done. And then the fighting Brett Bielema's, you know, thanks for playing. Uh, collect your check on the way out. <laughs> I like Steve. that. I, I do think it, it could be Iowa's turn. Iowa's had Wisconsin, you know, uh, Wisconsin's had Iowa's number for, you know, years and years, it seems like. And, uh, the division has come down to that, and Iowa always seems to falter in that game. Can't match the physicality, it seems like, most years that Wisconsin uh, has won those games. Northwestern seems to be up one year and down the next. And after being up last year, they might cycle back down a little bit. I, I think you have to take what happened with Minnesota, particularly since it's Ohio State's first game, and, and we're, we're selling – uh, the idea of be careful as opposed to the fact it's going to be 44 to nothing. I think you have to take what happened with Minnesota last year, curl it up a ball and throw it away because that season was doomed by COVID, I think, from the beginning. And by the end, they were actually playing some pretty good football. So I think Minnesota is probably maybe a little higher. 
Nebraska, again, kind of the same thing with Iowa. You just wait and you wonder and you wait and you wonder, is this the year? Is this the year? Is this the year? And, you know, by September the 15th, you know already it's not the year. I mean, lose, you know, lose to somebody that they shouldn't lose to or or get extended to double overtime by Northern Iowa or something stupid. So, you know, the the indicators are there by September the 15th, usually that it's not going to be their year. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they popped off nine wins somehow by accident. I don't know. They'd have to win all their home games and other than Ohio State, of course, and, uh, you know, uh, it, and maybe steal one or two on the road somewhere. But uh, they owe a lot of people, too. I mean, some of these schools, you know, Nebraska and Iowa, when you've had your nose rubbed in it, you know, year after year after year after year, you eventually either, you know, rise up and 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 state your case and make a make a play and, and to take somebody else's spot, or you just sit back and you take it year after year after year after year. It's dog eat dog world in the Big Ten, and uh, I agree with Kevin. I don't see a national championship contender out of the West per se, but I I see at least three very respectable teams that, that are going to be there by the end of the year. Like Kevin, uh, I said the same thing last summer, that Iowa and Wisconsin are the class of the division. I'm thinking the same thing right now, that they are the class of the division, not just because of really talent. There's not a talent separation between the top five teams in the in the division. If you believe in the recruiting rankings, it's just – the program, the process, the execution, they just know what they're doing. They've got the identity. They are just solid football programs. They get it done every year, every year. And to Steve's point, Wisconsin to a slightly better level than Iowa. Uh, Northwestern, uh, I haven't taken the deep dive on personnel and so forth yet, but uh, that would be the only exception I would take to possibly at this point, without, again, taking the deep dive that a lot of people are talking about, the Wildcats cycling down, but don't put anything pat, past Pat Fitzgerald. Uh, but uh, I, I will not make the mistake that I made last year because I talked the entire offseason that I was going to make a decision between Iowa and Wisconsin. And at the last minute, right before I made my predictions, I bought the uh, Nebraska hype by the Big Ten media who picked them to win the division, and I – it was one of the stupidest predictions I've ever made in my life. Uh, Kevin, by the way, our, our buddy Greg Peterson made a bold prediction last night that Nebraska is going to beat Wisconsin and Iowa. I had made the comment, it'd be great if they could pick off one of them. That'd be a step in the right direction. He said, they are going to win both of those games down the stretch. Yeah, Peterson, my buddy, the axe murderer, I just don't... Uh... And I and I told uh, I told one of the posters who I know was watching your show last night. I said, "Be sure to call Greg the Axe Murderer." Uh, I, I I think that he just is a little too optimistic in terms of what's going to happen there. I just I don't I don't see it for the Huskers this year. Um, you know they they certainly you know they certainly have a schedule that sets up to get a little bit of momentum with Illinois, Fordham, and Buffalo. And then they run into kind of a bit of a buzzsaw with uh, at Oklahoma. Then they go to Michigan State, and we haven't gotten to the East yet. But I th I think that uh, Oklahoma beats Nebraska to the point that they lose Michigan State because they haven't gotten it out of their head. And then they've got Michigan and or Northwestern and Michigan, so they got a tough four game stretch. And I think that if they if they go zero for four there, which I'm predicting them to do, uh, they're pretty much drawing dead at that point. I'd be cool with Iowa if they're the team that ends up in Indianapolis on the other sideline, just because I think Wisconsin's got that fatigue from being there and uh, not winning uh, other than the first couple, you know, back earlier in the decade, they won the first two. But then since then, I think it's been uh, pretty much an over for them. And that also reflects back on my other last thought on the West is I'm a Bielema believer. I mean, a guy that won several big 10 championships, you know, in his previous life as the Wisconsin coach, you, following that Barry Alvarez blueprint, which was offensive line, running backs, and great defense, uh, you know, was a pretty pretty good way to, to win football games in the Big Ten, particularly when the weather's bad. So uh, to my way of thinking, and, and I see uh, Kevin made a comment in our internal chat about Vilma, but uh, to my way of thinking, um, I think – you know, if he can keep some of the best players in Illinois at home, 
you know, he's got a chance to build something there. That's a big if because Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa are all coming in there to take – Indiana are all coming in there to take the best players. And just one last thought on Iowa, I think they'd travel well if, if their team got to Indianapolis. I know they were there once before and lost to Penn State, I think, in 2016 as an undefeated team, I believe Iowa may have been. Um, so – yeah, I, I'm uh, interested to see, you know, an Ohio State-Iowa championship game would be something different, and uh, it'd be a packed house, that's for sure, there at uh, Lucas Oil. Follow-up before we get to the East. Il or Illinois can win the state of Illinois in recruiting, and it still won't matter because I think with recruiting, there's the state of Illinois, and then there's about a three-county area around Chicago, and – I don't think that Illinois is ever going to win around Chicago is going to be the issue. So you can go and get the guy from Champaign. You can go and get the guy from Springfield. You can go and get the guy from from the farms or whatever. But I don't think that they're ever really going to be competitive within Cook County, DuPage County, uh, that area. And I think ultimately that's going to be the thing. That's the thing that's been keeping Illinois from being able to advance, in my opinion. On to the Big Ten Eastern Division and the suspenses. Will it be Rutgers or will it be Maryland? Here we go. Yeah, I just until somebody beats Ohio State within the conference, I just you know I I just don't see anybody really being close. Now that as I said on my show earlier this week, none of us predicted Iowa, none of us predicted Purdue, so. You know, things do happen. Uh, you know, obviously Ohio State's going to be tested week one and going to Minnesota is going to be tested week two with uh, with Oregon. But I think that uh, when and if Ohio State gets through those first two games, the schedule certainly decelerates for a while. And I think that you're going to see a team with uh, a lot of talent, maybe short on some experience and key positions, will be playing its best ball by the time that we get to the end of October. Uh, you know, Penn State – James Franklin has gone off and had his speeches about we're a good team, but are we an elite team? Yeah, it's nine and three, seven and two, elite? Probably not. I think that they're they'll win some games that uh, that'll be hard fought along the way, but I don't I don't like them against Ohio State, obviously, and I also have them losing. Uh, I'm losing their opener at Camp Randall, and then they also have that big non conference game against Auburn. Uh, Indiana is kind of the real test for me. I think eight and four, six and three might be best case scenario for them. Remember how Indiana beat Penn State to start the season and really kind of springboarded themselves. Uh, you know, obviously came up short against Ohio State in a game that was uh, difficult to watch if you were an Ohio State fan. You have Michael Penix back. He doesn't make it through seasons healthy. How will they have him for the whole season? Will they have him for part of the season? That's a big question. Uh, you you get Ty Freifogel back, you lose Wap Fillier. They definitely have an upgraded running back, getting Stephen Carr in from USC. So I think that I think there's some places that they can take some steps forward. I think that they've got a sneaky good defense in terms of you know compared to Indiana standards for sure. And I think they're one of the better defenses in the league. Then there's that team at four, at number four, seven and five, five and four, just enough to make it difficult to get rid of that guy as what it's going to be. I don't think that they're going to be able to break through and have what they consider to be a successful season. I think they're they're not awful enough to have that disastrous season to where they just have an easy excuse to say it's time to make a change. And then, you know, we get into the two the two new Big Ten teams. I like Rutgers a little bit better than Maryland here. I, I like Greg Schiano to get his team to a bowl. Uh, I think Mike Loxley's team is still – even with, with Tua's little brother at quarterback, I still don't think they have, have enough dudes around him. And then you've got Mel Tucker's Spartans team, 1-8. and eight, uh, Certainly going to be a challenge. But then again, did any of us see uh, Michigan State beating Michigan in Michigan last year? Granted, it was that weird COVID year and everything else. But that's the reason you play the games. But I, I think Michigan State is probably the team that has the furthest way to go in terms of, uh, of, of a 1-85 to 85 talent standpoint. Big Ten fans, take note of Kevin's overall records versus his conference records. Outside of Ohio State, Penn State loses to Auburn, Indiana loses to Cincinnati, Michigan loses to Washington, Maryland loses to West Virginia, I believe, is their out-of-conference game. 
Yeah, I'm mm. pulling it up right now. Maryland, Maryland, Maryland. I have them. Yeah, I have them losing to West uh, West Virginia, and then I just have Michigan State losing a lot. <laughs> yeah, I even left them alone. But uh, I, uh, all, all the key non-conference games are losses by the Big Ten East outside of Ohio State, Oregon. And that hurts because that's how you build your resume, and that's how your computer rankings and stuff are built uh, by – Iowa going out and beating Iowa State and uh, Indiana beating Cincinnati and, you know, Penn State somehow beating Auburn, Ohio State beating Oregon, Michigan beating Washington, and there's probably four or five more that I'm not even thinking. Wisconsin beating Notre Dame would be huge. So, um, you know, I see what Kevin's done here. I probably like this ladder a lot the way he's got it. Um I agree. I don't think Michigan's going to be have a losing record again this year. I think they're going to be back on the winning side of the ledger, whatever that looks like. Uh, I'm a Mel Tucker guy, so I think you know Michigan State long term with him is going to be okay. Uh, is it going to be Mark D'Antonio early? Mark D'Antonio contending and winning, or mid Mark D'Antonio? It took him three or four years to get it rolling, and then he had it rolling, and then it took him three or four years for all the wheels to fall off. Um, mid Mark D'Antonio, how long is it going to take him to get at the mid Mark D'Antonio uh, level? But uh, you know they have that gear. We've seen it. They can contend in the Big Ten at Michigan State. You can do it. It's been done. It's just Ohio State right now is recruiting at such a level that is so far and away out there that nobody in this conference can can really lay a glove on them. Now, will there be close games like Indiana last year? Yes. And, in fact, I have that as my toughest game on Ohio State's schedule at Indiana, potentially a night game, I would think, in think mid to late October, I think. Uh, they play potentially three night games in a row with uh, at Indiana, home with Penn State, and then at Nebraska, like November 7, which they can still have a night game the first weekend of November. So those may be Ohio State's three night games, as it turns out, uh, depending on what TV does and the World Series and Fox and ESPN, who's got what week and all that. But uh, at any rate, I think the, the game at Indiana could be the toughest. I told our guys internally, I see that as like a 14-point game but Ohio State gets the second, you know, the 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 clinching touchdown in the waning moments, you know, and 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 Lucy again pulls the football away from Charlie Brown for the 34th straight year, and Indiana goes, you know, ass over tea kettles or whatever, and that's that. But um, yeah, so at any rate, those are my uh, my thoughts. I agree. Uh, I think Penn State's going to be up there, just the games at Ohio State, and uh, that's a tough, tough road for them to hoe. There you have it, folks. Another edition of Ohio State Buckeyes Live, courtesy Kevin Noon from Buckeye Grove and Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts. Uh, Join them right there. And, of course, we've got the most people on the line that we've had the entire hour plus, so you know what you need to do. Wait for the video to post here in the last uh, next 15 minutes or so, and uh, you can watch what you missed. And uh, we appreciate these two, definitely their expert insight and information. You saw a slice of Kevin's work. So join them again on Buckeye Grove, Steve on Bucknuts. And we will see everybody back here next week. We may have to change the time because of Big Ten Media Days. That's why you subscribe, hit the bell for the notifications. That way you know when we're going live. And uh, tell people that we're here talking Ohio State football every week. And let's build up the audience. Uh, we appreciate it. Kevin, thank you so much. Steve, have a great time in indianapolis this year yep looking forward to it absolutely